in a lonely place with Matt Pinfield. Today's guest, Greg Hetson. Hey, it's Matt Pinfield. Welcome to In a Lonely Place. We started in the lonely place that was my living room uh, when I was uh, isolated uh, during the pandemic. And we thought that the Smithereen song was always so cool. New Order song was good too, and so was uh, the movie. Humphrey Bogart was in it in 1950. But we're no longer in a lonely place. Now we're in the studio in Studio City, rolling live studios. And I think one of the real drawbacks is that it's right next to two ice cream parlors. And uh, I've been, uh, yeah, you'll, you'll see me slowly gaining all the weight that I worked off back again because I'll be stopping in those ice cream places pretty regularly. But let's be serious now for a minute. I was being serious, actually. Um, Let me get my serious face on. Yeah, there we go. I want to tell you about my guest today. He's a great friend of mine and a guy that I've admired for a long, long time as part of uh, two of the most important uh, punk rock bands of all time, of course, Bad Religion and the Circle Jerks, who have now reformed and uh, recently had a big a debut in the Billboard Hot 100 with their debut album, Group Sex. And I've been wanting him to be on the show for a while, so I'm really happy that he's here. It's Greg Hetson. Greg, what's going on, man? Not much. Yeah, I'm glad we're here in the studio. We had some technical difficulties at my house. We tried to do this about a month ago. Yeah, but it's cool that you'd actually, you still get to do some punk rock karaoke stuff there. Yes. Which which is good. Now, for the people watching, one of the things that you've been doing during the pandemic, which is really cool, is continuing uh, the tradition of punk rock karaoke, which was a touring thing for so long. And I remember getting up and doing Sonic Reducer by the Dead Boys with you at the Viper Room. Mm -hmm. But um, you toured that all over, and recently you've been having all these legendary punk rock singers uh, on there, like Milo from The Descendants, and I was lucky enough to do Ace of Spades by Motorhead, and just a bunch of our other friends. Uh, Mark McGrath recently doing uh, Pretty Vacant, which was, he, he slayed it. Yeah, people were hating on that when we posted Mark McGrath's gonna sing, and we're like, Contempt prior to investigation. Wait till you hear it before you start hating on it. And, and it was he, great. He nailed it. Yeah, he was great. Yeah, Mark's amazing. He's a great guy. And he's told what his background is punk rock, he's of a course. Punker. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And people um, who know know. <laughs> yeah, people who do know. Absolutely. So hey, tell us about punk rock karaoke and how you started ended up doing that because it turned into such a great thing that people look forward to. And you've played all over the place. Tell me how it started. Well, a friend of mine hit me up. He had a restaurant. And he was like, uh, I want to do punk rock karaoke for my restaurant's anniversary party. And I go, there's no punk rock karaoke, you know, videos or machines. It's like, no, I want you to put together a, a karaoke band so people can come up and sing with it. And I'm like, that's a genius idea. So he had me, me and him brainstorm. We got some people together to do it uh, at his restaurant and... Uh, I think the original lineup had Eric Melvin from No Effects, Jennifer Finch, L7, Derek O'Brien, who was the original Social Distortion drummer. Uh, uh, Bob Mothersbaugh from Devo came in and sat on in on some some of the songs. We had a pretty good all star cast. A couple of different bass players and other people would rotate at first. Yeah, it's great. And now, of course, you got Stan Lee, who's great from the Dickies, right. you know. And so, you know, I remember seeing Stan in the band and seeing Circle Jerks with you all the way back in Trenton at City Gardens, seeing some of those early shows down there. I uh, was just and, driving through Trenton the other day. I was pretty close to it. <laughs> yeah. Did you pass the sign that says, Trenton makes the world takes? <laughs> no. didn't see. Did, yeah. didn't didn't go through the city. It was just kind of like, this is the highway towards Trenton. And I, Every time I pass that sign, I'm like, you know, uh, I think this thing is ancient because I don't know what Trenton's making now. Except for a lot of, uh, actually, you know, qualifying as one of the highest crime areas right, in the Right, it's country. making history as a crime area <laughs> and the state having to take over the police force and stuff. Or was that Camden? Whatever. There's just yeah. a couple bad areas. Yeah, they're there. close enough. That's the yeah. thing about it. Being from Jersey, I'm allowed to talk about it. I, I can I can do that. But so, so um, tell me about, then you decided to take it on the road. And um, recently, like I said, Stan Lee, Darren Pfeiffer... Uh, from Goldfinger is uh, in the band as well. Randy and Bradbury Randy from Bradbury. Pennywise. Yeah, yep. that's great. So uh, so tell me about some of the crazy places that you've been able to play. I know you did uh, Punk Rock Bowling in Vegas, right? Which was that gigantic festival. Yeah, right? we do that every year. We kind of close it out. We close it out every year at a, at a club show. And 
we've taken it on the road. We've done warp tours. We've done our own tours. We went to Europe once. Uh, and uh, yeah, we just kind of take it on the road and have some fun with it. When we first did it, we were like, this is great. This was a lot of fun. We get to, it's great for the people because they get to come up and be in a band for two and a half minutes. And it's cool for us because we could be a Sex Pistol for two and a half minutes or a Ramon. So it's a win-win for everybody. <laughs> it's a great time. It really is. And people come out from all over and they seem to have such a great time getting up they there do. and doing and if it. You, and if you're great, great. If you suck, even better. Yeah. Well, that's what it makes really it entertaining, yeah. right? At the end of the day, that's, what, that's the best part of karaoke. Mm -hmm. is when people really suck, yeah. that's part of the entertainment. It's part of its charm. Um, tell me, and speaking of touring Europe, you did a bunch of tours also with Marky Ramon. Tell me about that because... Being big Ramones fans that we are, yeah. Um, tell me, I mean, that's another thing, of course, that with uh, with the pandemic this year, Circle Jerks were going to go on tour, mm -hmm. you were going to do that, and uh, but you've done a bunch of tours with Marky Ramone. Tell me about that because him being the only real surviving Ramone now, you know, some people used to say, oh well, he's not one of the first four, but he's as important as the first four because he oh, yeah. was on so many of the great records, and you can't take that away from Marky. I've always defended him in that way. I think he's genius. Yeah. Uh he just hit me up. We had we were at some uh, what are those things called? One of those conventions where you go and hawk your wares and sign stuff, like a Comic Con type of thing. But it had music. It was, there was some music involved, and we were kind of sit. We we were next to each other in the booths, and we have the same agent that books us at these these events. And he goes, you know, Marky's looking for a guitar player. Would you be interested? I'm like, yeah. So Marky goes, yeah, I need a guitar player for this upcoming European tour, and I go, here's what it is. Here's the deal, and he writes out a set list. Here's a set list. There you go. And that was kind of that was kind of it. Yeah. And what? Is, how many? How many Ramon songs? I mean, did he do like twenty? Oh, uh, we did like 25? forty or something. Forty in one set, right? Yeah. Yeah, and it was bam, 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 nonstop. And I hadn't been on tour in a, in maybe four or five years, and it was it was a little challenging at first. It was you know to remember how to pace myself a on stage get into the groove of going bam, bam, bam with not stopping. But it was a lot of fun. Yeah. It's a, it must yeah, have Ramones were, you know, first punk band I got into. Yeah, and myself too. I can agree with you on that. I mean, 76, that's when we got that album, you know, when it came out, the first uh, the first record. Now, um, who else ends up playing with you on those marquee shows? Is it is there a guy named Sonny Vincent from the Testers that's done some shows? No, no? right now it's, it's, he's got... Uh, Right now, he's got a bass player in, from Argentina named Martin, and a, this guy Pale is a singer. He's from the Basque country. You can't say Spain; you got to say Basque country. He's from uh, from there, and uh, I think they have an Argentinian guitar player now. Well, it makes sense to me because you know Ramones are such a staple, not only here, of course, worldwide, but um, it's it, it's wow. When I was last year doing Rock in Rio in uh, in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, yeah. I walked outside my hotel. And there was a guy parking his car who was a local, and he was blasting the KKK took my baby away nice. by the Ramones. And I was like, wow, this is so cool. I'm in Brazil, and, and somebody's blasting the Ramones. Then I saw some kids skateboarding and playing This Charming Man by the Smiths. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, people really like good music down here. They yeah, been... yeah. It's a, it's a good spot for punk rock in uh, South America, for sure. Let's talk about you, Greg, uh, growing up, uh, you know, and, and discovering music yourself. I mean, tell me about when you first picked up the guitar and who were some of the records and people that you were, you were listening to as a kid that you were wanted to emulate? Yeah, well, my dad was really, he was a big vinyl collector, I guess. He would call him a vinyl junkie or just a music fan. He didn't play any, any instrument. He did have an acoustic guitar laying around that he never really got around to learning. But... Uh, you know, my parents just came up to me one day. It's like, son, to be a real, well-rounded human being, you need to learn an instrument. What do you want to play? And I think my one of my parents was driving me to school one day, and I heard the riff to Up Around the Bend by Credence. I'm like, I like that sound. What's that? And that's the guitar. I was like, I want to play that. <laughs> so I took some lessons. I was probably 10 or 11, and uh, didn't really stick with it. <laughs> yeah. Put the guitar under back under the bed. And didn't pick it up again until I was, uh, I'm 16. Yeah. But I was I was always buying records. I was buying a lot of the top 40 stuff. Yeah. What we liked. We're a month apart. Or we're born a month apart. Yeah. So so we just grew up listening to the same stuff. And as a kid, that's what you do. Yeah. It's the first thing. Of course, you're going to go to top 40. But there was also, you know, there was 
you know, FM back in the day was pretty much free form, like satellite radio. Anything went. You can cuss on the air. There was no program directors. And my dad listened to a lot of that. So I got a lot of the, you know, Vietnam protest songs and folk stuff. He was really into that. Yeah. So that kind of, I think, shaped my view of the world and where I ended up musically, you know, with the with protest music. Yeah. So what was the um, the first band that you were in? I mean, I know when I'm not talking about when you were in Red Cross. Were there was there like a band you formed maybe with guys from school before that or guys from the neighborhood? No, that was that was my band. I, I met <laughs> Jeff McDonald in Photoshop class. So you, in, so in you literally, school, yeah. So that was your first band. That was my Red first Cross. band. He was, he was, <laughs> uh, he was a freshman. I was a senior. I think he was, yeah. And uh, he had a a punk a bat like a bags flyer on his, you know, taped to his peachy folder. If anybody remembers those. And I go, oh, you like punk rock? And he kind of looked at me like I was going to give him shit. And he, I'm like. It's like, yeah. I'm like, yeah, so do I. And we started talking. And our, our teacher let us bring records in. And most of the kids were bringing in like disco and, you know, rock albums. And we would bring punk rock records in and, and play them while we were developing stuff in the photo lab. And then we just we, we started the band from there. Yeah, that's really cool you started with them. You know, when I brought my punk rock records in, there were people that were so flipped out by it and offended to music appreciation class in high school that I remember them uh, literally running out of the room with their <laughs> fingers in their ears, like, what is this stuff? And they're the same people now that go to stadiums and chant, hey, ho, let's go. So, of course. You know. <laughs> but, yeah, we, uh, and then around that, t- well, but around that time, you know, I was I took some lessons again, right around the time I, I met, met uh, Steve, and, I mean, Jeff McDonald. Did I say Steve or Jeff? I met Jeff in yeah. Photoshop. Yeah. I can't remember which one I said. You said Jeff. You were right. I did yeah. say Jeff. Okay. I'm a little frazzled. So you in school, I mean, so there here you are. You start with a band that becomes a well-known band. I mean, yeah. literally. And a popular band around Los Angeles with Posh Boy and everything. But we were like one of the, the first younger kid bands. Most of the bands, you know, the people were like, you know, in their early 20s. And we were a bunch of kids. And uh, around that time, we had discovered the first Black Flag single. This, yeah. is, this is my one of my favorite stories. Nervous <laughs> breakdown, right? So, Nervous yeah, breakdown. Yeah. And we looked, you know, we would always read the, the liner notes and it said, SST Records, P.O. Box 1, Lawndale, California. And we lived in Hawthorne, which is right next to Lawndale. So after school, we would go and, and stake out that the post office box yeah. at the post office in Lawndale, hoping we would meet them because we were trying to network. We didn't know how to get a gig. We were, you know... Uh, Steve was t- 11 or 12 when we started the band. Yeah. We ev- eventually met Black Flag and, and they kind of mentored us and helped us get gigs. That's amazing. That's really cool. So what were those early gigs like? And of course, Red Cross became a band that you know got more recognition in town because of Rodney on the Rock and mm-hmm. getting played on K-Rock. How did that transpire? How did you guys end up getting your music to him and to K-Rock at the time? Which was- uh, I just think that we met Robbie Fields from Posh Boy Records at a gig, maybe at the Hong Kong Cafe, which was a cool spot in Chinatown here, back in our day, Sunny. And uh, we thought it would be, there weren't that many punk labels, so we didn't have many choices. And he wanted to put out a, an EP, which ended up being a compilation before it was an EP. Yeah. So uh, that's kind of how that all started. Yeah. So you played with Red Cross for how many years, about? Was it about three years or no, so? No, not even. Yeah. I'm less, probably less than a year. I don't know. Yeah, less than a year. And if that, we met in Photoshop in 78 or 79-ish, so... Yeah, so within so, a year or so, you were doing yeah. the circle jerks. Yeah, the band started... We, we had our first gig sometime in 1979 with with uh, Red Cross, and by like November or December, I I had already left Red Cross and was starting the circle jerks with Keith. So tell me about how that all all happened. Like, like how, when you tell me about meeting Keith and the other two guys in the band. Um, well, yeah, we met we met Black Flag and they practiced at a place called the Church in Hermosa Beach, which was kind of like this uh, artist kind of hippie artisty, you know, center. And they had practice rooms, and we would practice down there. And uh, Black Flag practiced there as well. It was the last, I think, I have my last T-shirt on here. The Last, yeah. The Descendants, yeah. uh, 
who else? I can't remember. A couple other bands. Yeah. And uh, so uh, uh, Black Flag had this really regimented practice schedule and Keith didn't always want to practice every day. And their kind of role was like, no matter what you got going on, you got to practice. If you can't show up, we do it as a two piece or a three piece. So if only one person can do it, you got to show up. It just, so he would, he would hit me up to ditch black flag practice and, and drive into Hollywood to go to gigs in yeah. Hermosa Beach. And that's kind of how I became friends with Keith. And he had just left Black Flag. I just left Red Cross. And that's how we started. And you said, we're going to start a band together. Yeah. And it went from there. So tell me about going from that period of time uh, to going up to releasing a Group Sex. And uh... Uh, well, basically, we just decided we were going to you know, write some songs, <coughs> excuse me, and, uh, you know, play anywhere we could, parties, whatever, uh, you know, college college frat parties. We just wanted to go out and play. We took any gig. We didn't care if we were the first on a five band. We just wanted to get out there and, you know, get some experience because we were a new band, even though we'd come from other bands. And uh, that's kind of how, just how we just got going. And then... Uh, uh, Robbie Fields from Posh Boy hit us up about doing a, an EP and we started to record it and then he kind of went AWOL went on vacation and we didn't want to wait to release something so we went and recorded an album and got Frontier Records to put it out and Frontier put out the first and we record. just ended up finishing Wild in the Streets and give, giving that to him for the Rodney on the Rock compilation yeah. That's what you did, yeah, for the Posh Boy compilation yeah. at that period of time. We kind of dicked him over, but it's all good now. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure he understands this <laughs> thing. Didn't want to wait. We had things we needed to do. Yeah, damn it. And, and you wanted to keep it fresh at that yeah. period of time where it was where it was happening. Mm -hmm. And uh, speaking of group sex, doesn't it blow your mind? Uh, you just didn't you just debut on the Billboard Hot 100 albums at number 72 with the so, reissue? Yeah, like 40 years later, we're on the Billboard 100 <laughs> charts. We probably promptly fell out of it, fell off of it, but that's cool. Yeah. But it was great to see you guys in there. Like you guys were right yeah, next who to like would've, Adele who and Queen's Greatest Hits. Yeah. And Circle Jerks, Group Sex. And I thought that was amazing. It's crazy. It's cool. It's cool. It is see. way cool. Yeah, we just, you know, we released the 40th, the 40th anniversary with some bonus <laughs> ghetto blaster recording from yeah. uh, Keith's mom's garage where we practiced in Inglewood. Yeah. And uh, cool packaging. Shameless self-promotion. Yeah. No, but you should let people know. Yeah. I mean, it's great. And I know that the first run of them sold out really quickly. Yeah. But there's we're gonna, a, there's we're a gonna booklet. Do, we're going to do a run of some other colored vinyl. So if you didn't get the first ones, it's all yeah. good. Yeah. It's really cool, by the way. It's great. Now, um, so talk to me about, so so you go from that album, Group Sex, uh, to Wild in the Streets, right? Which is the second album. Right. And um, you had so many fans that, that ended up in punk rock bands that you know from later on. Like, we, you know, you and I hang out with Tim Armstrong from Rancid. We talked to him. He loves those records so much as well and talks about them. And he was wearing a homemade Wild in the Streets t shirt a couple of weeks ago oh, when really? the three of us were together. Oh, right. Like, yeah, I didn't yeah. think he knew you were going to show up actually there, but he just wore <laughs> it anyway, which I thought was really cool because he loves that record. But um, tell me about what it was like because I know when I saw you on tour on the East Coast, you guys were hitting the road. What were those? early tours like for you like in that punk rock diy way what was the vehicle that you had i mean did you know were you making mix cassettes what was it you know on the road using like the uh you know a map an atlas map to get around what was it like those early touring days uh yeah we we had a van and with all the gear in it and uh it was kind of hit or miss i mean some places in the u.s were had a good punk scene, you know, L.A., Chicago, New York, you know, D.C. But sometimes you hit places like North Carolina and you're playing at a club where ev every band went through. I forgot the name of it now. Was it the Milestone? I think so. Is that, does that sound familiar? Anybody from North Carolina or whatever? Yeah. Uh, anyway, it was basically a house that they converted into a club and you played in the living room. They had PA column set up. And that's where all the bands came to, the alternative or college radio or the punk rock, whatever you wanted to call it back then. Everybody went through and, and played that. So that was kind of like what it was. A lot of DIY hall gigs. Sometimes you'd show up and it had already been canceled 
because <laughs> there was no permits. The cops already broken up before he even pulled up to load in. So it was a lot of, lot of chaos, but a lot of fun. And we had the road atlas and we had these, uh, you know, bogus calling card numbers so he can call home or the agent to find yeah. out what was going on. Yeah. They were, they were like, uh, they were just numbers that you had to call, you called, what was it, what was it for long distance? Well, you know, back then you'd, you'd get, go to a pay phone and like, I'd like to make a call and charge it to another number. Yeah. Oh, so you oh, totally do but the creative it, things we would do to get away with it. Yeah. And not pay yeah. for it because we didn't have yeah. the money, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> we didn't have the money. We were, you know, we were barely breaking even on tours, you know, yeah. having a good time. But, uh, so there was this, a magazine called Overthrow. Remember that magazine? Yeah, yeah. And it was kind of like a, you know, subculture anti-establishment magazine. And they had a list of calling card numbers that would work from like IBM and Coca-Cola and whatever, electric companies. So you, we would just pick some random one, go down the list to make our phone calls. And That's amazing. they get charged back. Sometimes you charge it back to the phone company, which yeah. is always fun. It's amazing that you can get away with that. I mean, I think that's great. It reminds me of the Abby Hoffman and steal this book, right? Yeah. You know what I mean? Because just like giving you ways to get over on the establishment. Exactly. I think it was really important back then. Yeah. Not to mention, I mean, how many how many like living room floors did you sleep on? And and was we it, did and that. a couch was couch we was the luxury, right? Yeah, we, we learned pretty quickly that if people invite each other house, that meant there was gonna be a party and you were getting no sleep. So we would just pile everybody up in one or two rooms. We started with one room, and if we made a little extra money, we'd get two. Yeah. You know? Because those nights little... at places, you weren't getting any rest. There was, like, serious drinking going on. Yeah. Or some or drugging, or or just people in general raging, so. Yeah. It's... So you would actually literally have to discipline yourselves, right? And go, hey, man, that, that last night, we I, we got to be able to play tomorrow. We got to get some yeah. rest. Exactly. And, we learned that pretty quickly. You know, there's uh, there's great stories about some of the like one sheets and flyers that you guys had sent out when you first started touring, saying we are a nonviolent punk band. You know, <laughs> tell me about that. Those things. Was that who was handling the booking for you guys at that period? Of time? Uh, I would guess when we first started, we were doing everything ourselves, and probably, I think our first tour we went out of out of uh, the state was probably 1981. We went to the East Coast and we had an agent out of New York book it. But yeah. we pretty were much doing it ourselves until we got uh, a real agent when Wild in the Streets came out. But yeah, we just went, you know, there was there was some violence kind of starting to creep into the into the scene then. And uh, we just wanted to make it known that we were just out to have a party. We didn't want, we weren't causing any trouble. You wanted to have fun. It's yeah. amazing when I see those pictures of you, Craig. It's like, you, got, you guys are all, you and Keith and the guys are all, you're just kids, man. Yeah. I mean, you're literally kids at, the, at that time. Yeah, you know? I was 19 when the band started, yeah. And did you, uh, what, what are some of the, I mean, when, you, when you're touring like that and you're on your first tour, do you have any certain memories of things that are good or bad that happen while, you, while you're on the road? Was there, was there any crazy moments or um, just like breaking down or any of that other kind of stuff? What, what was happening? At that oh, time? let's see. Early crazy moments. Hmm. <clears throat> There's some crazy moments where, uh, you know, where people might have got a little out of hand by partying and ended up passing out in the lobby and we'd have we'd have to scramble out of the hotel because the cops were on their way. Yeah. yeah. There was a few things like that. Yeah. And uh oh, what else? Oh, and was your of? vehicle very dependable? I mean, did they make it through almost always? Yeah, our first touring vehicle, I think we we went to, we we started out with renting vans and we realized that was not very economical cuz we came back with yeah. no money. So we had a uh, uh, a short, I don't know what you would call it. It was, a, it was a panel van, a Dodge panel van, but it wasn't a long one. It was very short. No seats in the back. We put some carpeting down and there'd be like six or seven people in it and we pulled a trailer. Yeah. No air conditioning and, and that's how we toured. I remember one tour, we started out, it would, you know, we started out, it was like a three-month tour. It was snowing. And by the time we ended up in Texas, it was like 110 degrees with 90% humidity. Yeah. And by the time the thing changed, so you, you got to experience all of it, right? Yeah. We had to prop the back door open with a block of wood and some, some rope so we can get some ventilation through. So, so you wouldn't yeah. pass out while you guys so, were trying yeah, to drive. Yeah. And then did you do the whole driving in shifts so you could go and get to the next gig yep. on time? Yep. And, uh, and who, did everybody... 
democratically control the cassette player or the radio? I know we, you. Your you know, first did, tour, you only had a radio, right? You only AM had a radio. radio. Only had AM radio, so it was just all AM radio, AM radio, talk radio, and you'd hear top forty of what was going on yeah, at that period. Maybe of time. someone brought a little portable cassette player. Yeah, but yeah, it was it was pretty democratic. On, yeah, and on then what what was the second vehicle? Did you have a cassette player in there? Because I mean, it's so important. Yeah. to music when you're driving long distances. Yes, we had a, we had a cassette player on the second vehicle. We got. That's amazing. That's great stuff. So tell me about... Oh, we also had, I remember also on the first vehicle, I had like a portable TV that was battery operated or you could plug into the... Uh, actually, you plugged it into the... Uh, lighter? Cigarette lighter, yeah. And we'd put the aerial out, out the fly window. Anybody remember fly windows? Yeah, that is amazing. <laughs> yeah. I just remember one time we, we had it like rigged and we were all watching this like football game and it started to snow and the reception was coming in and out. It was a really exciting game. And we we're trying to watch you're like, this this like playoff game driving yeah. through the snow and up, and you're just trying to the, keep it the signal from yeah. co coming in. Going and up then, up through uh what's that? Mount Shasta. I just remember driving up through Mount Shasta and we're trying to watch the end of this football game. So we had fun stuff like that. That is funny. It was, did, did you guys do a coin toss to see who ended up driving during the game so that they were the ones who didn't get to watch it? No, it was, there was a couple of main drivers. I was one of them and one of our crew guys. Yeah. We did the bulk of the driving. Yeah. I just like to drive. What kind of, it's relaxing to me. Those portable TVs, you know, it's funny. It reminds me of like back when in the 70s when I was a little, you know, young kid going to concerts with my older brother. Mm -hmm. And in Port Authority, they used to have these weird TVs in the chairs. But you had to put We're a quarter in them. I remember <laughs> those, yeah. Put a quarter mm -hmm. in them to watch television, and the reception was shit. It was like, you know, it's like, you know, there's all kinds of lines across oh, people's that faces. That reminds me of early touring, going to like a Motel 6, and it cost extra for like extra 50 cents or a dollar a day for the, the TV. Yeah. And sometimes we just couldn't afford it, so we didn't have a TV. <laughs> yeah. We couldn't put the TV on. Because that 50 cents meant gas. Yeah. Doesn't it blow your mind now, like, because <clears throat> gas is so expensive and things have changed so much, that people couldn't do the kind of touring that you guys did back in the day. I mean, it was, gas was so inexpensive that it, it, was, it gave you a lot more freedom, right? Yeah. I don't, I don't know what the, it would be in the, with the cost of living these days, but the gas taxes were a lot lower everywhere. Yeah. They were definitely lower. And... and I remember when I was upset when it became a dollar for a gallon of gas. I was like, what do you mean? What do you mean a dollar? Dating myself, but that's okay. It's not, I don't mind that. You know, I'm not trying to pretend I'm any younger than I am, which is amazing. Greg, uh, let's, uh, so, you know, we could also quickly, um, you know, then you left and went to Bad Religion. And how many years did you play with Bad Religion? I mean. I was in both bands for a while. You I were? I did double duty for a while, like yeah. starting in 84. And then I think the Circle Jerks, broke up for the first time in 1990. So I was kind of lucky where I was doing double duty and while the circle jerks were imploding, the uh, bad religion started to take off. So I got kind of lucky. Thank, yeah. Thank the good lords. And then all of a sudden you guys had signed it to Atlantic, right? You know? Yeah, after like putting out three or four albums on Epitaph. Yeah. You'd done the Epitaph records yeah. and others before. And um, and then, uh, you know, that record uh, really took off for you guys. I mean, Recipe for Hate was already starting to get airplay. Yeah. I mean, you know, it was. And even, you know, off Against the Grain, the original version of right. 21st Century yep. Digital Boy. I remember playing it on the radio. For, uh, but, uh, and then all those things started to, uh, I mean, all of a sudden, then Atlantic, then the torch got bigger and, and everything like that. And what, but currently. But what was funny, what was strange, it's like, we'd be touring the U.S. and we could barely get arrested. we go to to Germany and we were, you know, drawing a thousand people. So we kind of got bigger, big in Germany before we got big in the U.S. With bad religion. With wow. bad religion, yeah. yeah. That's amazing. Was the U.K. like that as well or is it more like... No, something? the U.K. was was one of our, was our weakest market in yeah. Europe. Yeah, yeah. It took a while to break, break into the U.K. market. Yeah, which is amazing. So let's say, so recently you guys reformed the Circle Jerks, mm -hmm. which people are so excited about. And you were slated to tour and do a bunch of shows when this damn pandemic came along. Angry, angry uh, face. Angry, you know? <laughs> um, but tell me about how you and Keith and, er, ended up getting back together. Because, I mean, f you know, for a little while, you guys you guys really, I mean, because you guys hadn't spoke for a while. You guys, your lives going in different directions. Right. You know? You know, we weren't on bad terms, but we, but we weren't, wasn't, for some reason, it just wasn't the right time or we weren't ready to get back together. And things kind of started thawing about a year and a half ago 
and I heard some grumblings that, you know, we might be getting back together. But I've heard that before. And then it actually did happen. And uh, we committed to, first we committed to punk rock bowling and a bunch of other festivals and some some touring. And then, you know, the, the zombie apocalypse happens. Yeah, which is unbelievable. I mean, now that you know that there's such an interest, Trust Records Company uh, put out Group Sex. They're yeah. going to do the same thing with Wild in the Streets. Yep. I mean, they're going to continue to uh, put out the records and they've been doing cool. They're going to do cool reissues. Yeah, it's going to be cool. It's, it's going to be similar to the group sex. We're going to have, you know, bonus material and a cool insert. And, yeah. All, uh, and, all and we're these, also going to, back in the, I don't know what year it was, we decided to remix Wild in the Streets. So the new version, the new old version of Wild in the Streets is going to be the original mixes, yeah. which have not been available since, oh, I don't know, maybe the late 80s, early 90s. Yeah. Because like we didn't, you know, we went in and recorded the thing like in four days or something. Yeah. We were like, oh, we didn't like the way it sounded and we remixed it and then we realized, yeah, it was kind of good the first way. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, and, and people knew it that way as well. Yeah. Which is cool. It's kind of like, it's when sometimes when people remix albums, you're just like, wait a minute, that's not how I know it, you know? Yeah. I've had people have done that before. I did it with a David Bowie album, I think Station to Station. And I was like, what the, what, what's going on here? Leave it the way it is. But I mean, I think it's great that you guys are have these reissues. Yep. It's obviously people are excited for these shows. So when this pandemic does pass, yes. we'll get some great Circle Jerk shows. Yes, we are committed. We're not going anywhere. We're back. Woohoo. <laughs> That's great. Well, listen, let's talk about, we do, uh, you know, our favorite, uh, you know, we, we talk to our favorite artists about seven records that are a big part of their life, either the favorite records of all time. How did you come up with the number seven? Um, I think I, I got, I could blame Chris Trevero that. Did you, did, wasn't it 10 and then you made it seven, Chris? Yeah, because we couldn't get 10 done. We couldn't get, mm -hmm. we, could, well, we, could, <laughs> we, uh, we couldn't get them done in time. Yes. Yeah, I mean, uh -huh. it was just, we would go on and on okay. and on. And, I mean, it was it was good, though. I mean, I enjoyed doing 10. Seven is tough. But Ten would be easier, but it's still not easy. Yeah. Oh, listen, man, in my book, I mean, for each decade, they asked me to put 50 down. I'm like, 50? Are you kidding Damn. me? Damn. That's like, it's hard to do. I mean, even for that, because there's been so many mm -hmm. great records, because we like so many genres. Right. But, you know, these are records that were very influential in your life. And you and I have had these conversations before we did this show about so many records we loved growing up, because, yeah. again, we were born a month apart. So... The first record that you picked here is the fourth album from Aerosmith and the third that Jack Douglas produced. Great record for the band. And Lovely great graphics. And there it is. Rocks right behind us. Uh, tell us why you picked that. I mean, I'm sure knowing you, you probably already had the earlier albums too with Toys in the Attic being a huge one and Get Your Wings and, and the yeah, first one. I but remember you, it was just funny in high school and maybe, be, you know, before I went totally punk, uh, you know, before I put the Mohawk up. But... Uh, and we had a jukebox in our in our uh, high school cafeteria, and it was always a, uh, a a mad dash to who could feed the jukebox. The, the kids that liked disco, or us that liked rock music, and we actually had toys in the attic on the jukebox. I just remember that was a big. A oh, big, so it was an actual <laughs> album jukebox, or was it? yeah, yeah, it was forty five singles. Oh, 45. So yeah, would, yeah. So you would have like walk this way or toys in the attic or something like yeah, that. Yeah, there from, was some rock stuff. Anyway, yeah. but rocks. Uh, I don't know, there was just something about the, it's just a really dark sounding record. It's, you can just feel that this weird dark, like maybe, I don't know if, I don't know if they were all fucked up on drugs or, <laughs> it, or whatever it is, it's got this weird, it's got a cool energy. It's got this, you know, bad, bad energy in a good way. Yeah. So I've always liked that record. I wasn't doing drugs back then, but for some, something caught me about that. This is, this is dangerous. Yeah. It did. It's, I mean, even uh, just the way, the, the bottom end on that record, right? Yeah. Like starting with Back in the Saddle. And yeah. And songs it, like it, Combination. Heavy. Things that are, you know, like Rats in the Cellar. Sick as a Dog being a great song to open that second side, yep. right? But uh, yeah, it's and very- the, the sounds great. The guitar tones are great. I was just, you know, learning guitar around that time. So it was heavy guitar influence record that I enjoyed. Yeah. Did you ever get to see Aerosmith back then when you were younger? I saw them on the what was what was the album after Rocks? Uh Draw the Line. I saw them on the Draw the Line tour. Yeah. And it was so loud and distorted and they were terrible. Yeah. Oh, that's <laughs> my I saw them later on, they were great. Yeah. Well that's the thing that happened with me. I saw <clears throat> the Rocks tour with Ted Nugent opening, right? 
And I just seen Queen at the Beacon Theater in 1976. Phenomenal, right? Seeing that night at the opera in the Beacon yeah. Theater. And they were top of their game. And then seeing some other bands around that period of time. And then going, loving Aerosmith, being one of my favorite bands. And being most disappointing show yeah. ever. And I've actually told them that I was brokenhearted by that show. <laughs> I was supposed to go to the tour. You went to draw the line, except one of my friends changed the... Um, Changed like the numbers on the tickets. He thought he was going to get us better seats, and they walked us in through the orchestra. And I'm like, wow! Yeah. And walked us right out the back door, oh. <laughs> so we never got to see that show. Oh man, which was unbelievable. That's terrible. It was my guitar player in my band. But anyway, mm. um, you mm. know, um, uh, they were so much better later. Like permanent oh, vacation, sure. I saw that show, that yeah. tour. That, Is that was when great. You saw they them? were great. Yeah, yeah, because they had Deep Purple in the middle, and uh, and they had uh, Guns N' Roses opening, and uh, they I were. Rem- I think I missed the openers, but I did see that tour. He was doing backflips, Steven Tyler. He was like the best I'd ever seen him. And he sounded amazing. Yeah. They all did. You know? Anyway, I'm glad I am glad we I'm glad we they got to redeem themselves all yes, those years did. later. They're a fine rock combo. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and still all original members, which is uh, yeah. which is a great thing too. Well, it's all original members again. Depends on uh, who's playing right now. There's just a little Joey Kramer issue. Yes, there is on that last thing. But there's always something, yeah. right? Yeah. Now, the next record that you picked is, uh, again, it's one of those records. It's funny that we're talking about your favorite albums because this is one of mine as well. Hold on, can I do the click? Yeah. Like the PowerPoint? The next one. It's Creedence Clearwater Revival. There we go. Let's Cosmos Factory, yes. right? Yes. Is it, so you changed it. So you got the magic. Now, I, uh-huh. like you, love this record. This was their biggest album. Um, uh, I think probably their biggest selling, maybe, you know, I'm almost sure, but it had the most hits on it. That's right. for sure. Because, right, it had Looking Out My Back Door, Up Around the Bend, Who'll Stop mm-hmm. the Rain, Traveling Band, yeah, all those songs on there, Run Through the Jungle, Long As I Can See the Light, and I Heard It Through the Grapevine, which they released later. Tell me why it's such an important record to you. Oh, basically because it has Up Around the Bend on it, and that was the, <laughs> the, the song that made me want to play guitar. Yeah. And... I'd still, I mean, you listen to these those old Credence records and they still sound great. The production value was great. And, uh, you know, I guess the lyrical content yeah. was pretty decent. And he had a great soulful voice. Voice, he had a, You know, John yeah. Florida has a cool voice. Not to mention, do you love the fact that he um, said that he made like, in fact, the year 1969, they put out three albums in one year. I, and, that was crazy. Back in the day, you had to do at least two albums a year. Yeah. Because everything was pretty single-oriented back then. Yeah. So it was all about the singles. <laughs> all about the singles. And I was buying singles before that, and this is one of the first full albums of any band I did. It might have been the first yeah. album I bought besides like a Beatles album. Yeah. I think it's about the same. I, yeah. I, I agree with you. And it's just, it, it was a big bang for your buck at that period of time. Yeah. Because, you know, if you were mowing lawns or delivering papers or whatever you were doing to earn your money at that time, I mean, there were a lot of hits on this record. It's yep. a great album. It is. But do you know what John Fogarty said in an interview? He said that the reason he never stopped writing recordings, he was afraid people were going to forget about them. Yeah. And they never did. <laughs> yeah. His records still hold up. And it, it's cool about it. It's like you can see all the instruments they're playing. It's cool. Like in a, a rehearsal spot or something, which I always yeah was cool. Yeah, it was what's his name, um, uh, Doug think, Clifford's. Yeah, isn't there a? Uh, I can't tell by the graphic there. There's like a there's like one of those toy organs there, which I had at the time. Yeah, one of those, and there was a, a light bright. Isn't that a light bright yeah. there? Yeah, I had a light bright. It was kind of cool. I was like, oh, they're kind of normal people. Yeah, exactly. They're not, they're not super he- heroes because they're in a band and they're touring the world. Yeah. I know it's amazing. Yeah, they had it was and, it was and a ten speed. Look at that derailer. <laughs> yeah, got a ten speed in there too, and it's cool because again, it really was their rehearsal space, yeah. right? It was uh, mm-hmm. Doug Clifford, um, uh, the drummer's uh, place, and they uh, his nickname was Cosmo. So oh, that's where the Cosmo. I was wondering where that came from. from. Now I know. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, there you go. Just a I'm little. A, bit. I learned, but I needed to know. Today I'm out of here. Okay, you got it. We'll see you next okay, time. We'll, we'll finish this interview. Around now, you are playing in punk rock karaoke with one of your all time heroes, who's now one of your best friends. Yeah, Stan Lee from the Dickies. So you, the next album that you picked was you can use the switcher. Go ahead. There it is, the incredible shrinking Dickies, which is uh, the band's first full length album, of course, right? Right. Um, now tell me about how you discovered this record and why it's so important to you. Well, I discovered the band on, on K-Rock, on the Rodney on the Rock show. They were playing the Dickies. And I saw that they were playing at the Whiskey. And I hadn't gone to any club shows. So it was the first 
a club show I ever went to and the first punk rock show I ever went to. So, and it was the Dickies and the middle class opened up. And yeah. when the middle class came on, with all these kids like my age, and that really inspired me like, oh yeah, I can, I can do this. I don't need to be a guitar virtuoso. Because back in that day, you know, Van Halen was coming out and every, all these guitar players was, were starting to play these technical, crazy, you know, shreddy stuff. And I couldn't play that way at that time. I still can't. It's not my thing. But seeing bands like this made me feel like I was, you know, there was not much separation between the audience and the band. The bands were hanging out in the crowd. I'm like, what? what is this? This is weird. Yeah, I mean, that was what punk rock was mm-hmm. all about, was and, putting everybody on an yeah. equal level in the first place, which I think was the thing that so was cool. It was, a, you know, influential, The first one of the first punk albums I bought. Mary, what are some of your favorite tracks on it? Oh, yeah. Pick one. I'm drawing a blank what's on it. Yeah, right? <laughs> is uh, Nights in White Satin on there? Um, I know. No. No, it's not. What is Doggy it? Doggy Doo, is that on Doggy there? Doo's on that's there. Good. Give It Back's give on it there, back. which I yeah, love. Give It Back, give it back yeah. is the best. Curb yeah. Job. Yeah, Curb Job's on there. Those are the original yeah. songs. I mean, there's covers. Yeah. They've always done covers. My my favorite cover is Gigantor, that single yeah. of that, their cover of the, the cartoon theme. But I was thinking for a minute, because they've done so many cool covers, like Nights in White Satin. They did so many other... I mean, everything that they sped up. Paranoid. Paranoid, of course, they did great. I think that was the first song I might have heard by them, Paranoid. Yeah. They were playing and you couldn't believe it was faster than the Black Sabbath version. Yeah. Which was I'm the like, thing. Was, was and amazing. you listen to it now, and it's not even that fast, but back then, yeah, it was, you it know. Was, it was like nothing else, right? And, yeah. And uh, they were on that compilation album of A&M Records called No Wave. Right. That had The Stranglers. I think it had The Police and Joe Jackson on yep. it. Um, and a few other people, but it had Give It Back and Paranoid on there, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, no, mm-hmm. You Drive Me Ape, You Big Gorilla. Right. So it was oh, things, that was on there too, yep. yeah. So those were the songs that were on that compilation. That's how I discovered the Dickies. Yeah. I bought that and said, oh, that's, this is a cool. Well, I had, the, I had like the 10-inch the, the of, uh, the 10-inch Dickies, of, I forgot, I'm drawing a blank what's on there. It was probably Paranoid and some other stuff yeah. on there. Yeah, I like white way- vinyl, and then I bought, bought this album, and, yeah, and that came out. I thought it was really funny when we were recording our punk rock karaoke track and Stan goes, and I just happened to say, oh, I have the Gigantor single with Bowling with Bedrock Barney uh, with the black and white, you know, cover on the back of the kid in the cartoon. He goes, you have that copy? I go, yeah. He goes, that's worth seven thousand dollars. I'm like, what? <laughs> seven is worth seven thousand. I'm like, it's probably in a box, beat up somewhere. I didn't take good enough care of it. And now, we, not and, that I'd get rid yeah. of it anyway, but I think I didn't realize that there was a color version of it that was like the main one. Yeah, I just ended up, you know, you bought the one you could find. Exactly. Back in those days, with punk rock records in stores, you they're usually if they stocked one, you were lucky. You got in there, or you knew. And there's like one a, or two. three or four shit. It's for show. Three or four record stores in each major city that actually. You can buy and find punk rock. Yeah. So it was more of a... You had to hunt it down. Yeah, yeah. You had to really hunt it down. Now, what I love is a, a wild card that you uh, pulled next, your latest album. So if you can use the clicker. All right. Herb Albert and the Tijuana Brass, which is, uh, I mean, it's amazing. <laughs> we were just talking about A&M Records. Yep. Herb Albert starting that record label with Jerry Moss. That's what the A&M meant. B in the A, and Albert. B in the A. Albert. And just how big the Tijuana Brass were. But what it blows me away is that I hear a lot of those records were actually the Wrecking Crew, right, on a yeah. lot of those records. So it was, you know, Glenn Campbell maybe playing on it or somebody like Hal Blaine. Sure. Well, either way, it just had this, there was something about it transporting you, right? I mean, yeah. it gave you this feeling that you were in other places. Tell me why you love this It was record. one of the only records that my parents played that I actually liked because my dad was really into folk music and I really detested it for some reason. Yeah. I don't know why, even though, you know, it has that anti-establishment <laughs> lyric, which, you know, a- ended up leaning towards with my choice of genres to play. Yeah. But uh, for some reason, it's just it's just happy, happy music. Yeah. It, it's anytime, really... I, anytime I put on Herb Alpert, I, I get happy. And yeah. we would also, we would use like Herb Alpert as, as the music to go on before we, went on stage with the circle jerks and the kids either hated it or they were just dancing in the pit to yeah. Herb Alpert, Herb Alpert. So yeah. it's just good time, feel good music. It really is. You know, I remember, I think there was, I think I had a seven inch of Zorbi the Greep with Tijuana Taxi on yeah. the back of it. But uh, I love, did you like when Soul Asylum on Twin Tone used the whipped cream album cover and did like yeah, the mock of it? Yeah, they did the homage. Yeah, that. Yeah, <laughs> it was, was great. very cool. 
you know, in the early uh, Soul Asylum stuff. But yeah, Herb Alpert, man, the guy was a, an amazing, amazing guy. There's no and question the about fact, it. you know, knowing knowing the history now, it, it was one of the first labels started as a you know indie label started by a re, a, an artist, like a musician, yeah. that wanted to give better deals to the to the people they signed. So. Yeah, Res respect. <laughs> yeah, you got you got to give uh, Herb and Herb, Jerry that respect. Yeah, for sure. No question about it. Now, what I love you pick next is, uh, you know, I, I, a lot of people would have maybe picked one of the uh, records after the band had signed to Columbia with Sin mm -hmm. After Sin, but with Judas Priest, there were two independent albums that came out in America right. first: Rock Rolla and, of course, Sad Wings of mm -hmm. Destiny. Um, tell me how you discovered was that. Sin After Sin after this. Yeah, Before, Sin After Sin was uh, after. okay. Yeah. Uh, why did I choose this? Well, getting back to, you know, the Aerosmith and finding hard, heavy music. And, you know, Queen was, was getting big and I was into Sparks. And any, anything with a high-pitched singer was, was cool. And most, most outrageous, you know, stuff you, you could hear is what me and my friends were into. Like Freddie Mercury and like a Ron Mayo. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And uh, so we got, uh, so I got into this record and I just, you know, it's really heavy guitar laced rock and uh i just remember always sometimes ditching uh going home for lunch for school and then not going back so i can listen to the like it rocks and and she judas priest and of destiny, destiny. Like so it's just one of those it's just, it's a comfort album <laughs> yeah how did you discover it because uh i didn't discover it been until sin after sin and i stumbled on that Nobody was playing on the radio in New York. So yeah. I went to see them open for Stars and REO Speedwagon. I was going to see Stars, the band in the middle. Yeah. Because they were managed by Bill Alcoin, uh, who managed Kiss. So you saw Rocksteady Productions on the record. And you're mm -hmm. like, oh, well, if I like Kiss, then I'll I'll check this band out, yeah. Stars. So I bought the record. They were opening for a band called REO Speedwagon. were headlining, but they were more of a Midwest band. So yeah. we never heard them on the radio in New York. It was really interesting how... It was I'm, very geographical. I'm trying to remember how I got into them. I don't know if uh, I had a friend who had an older brother who kind of turned me on to aid the Ramones, so he might have turned us on to Judas Priest as yeah, well. Yeah, I think it's it's interesting because I saw them sin after sin tour, and they, if you look at the stage that you and I are sitting on right now, it's basically... Was this how much five guys in a band had to play on? It was this yeah. small because they were the... First of three bands at the New York Palladium. Yeah, I, and, I saw them open for uh, the headliner was Mahogany Rush, and the middle band was Fandango, and Judas Priest was the opener, and that was probably around seventy eight ish. Yeah, and they didn't sell any. They weren't allowed to sell any merch. I mean, my friends were bummed because we couldn't buy a Judas Priest shirt. Oh, they weren't allowed because of the headliner. Yeah, yeah. Mahogany Rush would not let them. And Frank Marino was yeah, not being a good sport. And he was not being a good sport. <laughs> uh, but uh, they had played maybe a month or so before at, at the Whiskey, and I wasn't allowed to go to the gig. Because you were too young. I was too young. So, but my parents were cool for me going to the Santa Monica Civic to see them. Yeah. So, Santa Monica Civic, a place that I've never been to a show, but I know, you know, seeing the Bowie bootleg from the Ziggy Stones yeah. tour, always, it had like a mythical thing for me as a kid. Cause I'm like, wow, Santa Monica Civic go to tour, it sounds so cool. You know, of course now I drive by it, but you know, you, you got to see the shows there. Yeah. Which is, which is pretty got amazing. to play there too, which is pretty cool as well. Yeah. How was that? Tell me about playing it. I mean, was, is it a great venue? <clears throat> yeah, it's I've a great venue. There. It's uh what, how many seats is it? You think is it like a they? There's there's two configurations. It's either like thirty five hundred or maybe forty five hundred. I don't yeah. know. So in other words, uh, they'll close off some. Yeah, and there, there's like any arena. There's, there's seats. There's seats like in the back, and there's a big floor that that elevates or they could adjust the uh, the capacity to a big stage or a smaller stage. They used to have college basketball games in there. It's kind of a weird, a weird, cool venue. Yeah, multi purpose. Sounds... Sounds great. I hope I get to see a show there one day. Yeah. When we start seeing shows again. Now, one of the next records that you picked is one of my favorite records of all time. Certainly my favorite record by this band because it's the first one that I ever owned. And it was the one right before Night at the Opera. Their third album, Sheer Heart Attack. Why do you love this Queen album? Uh, well, uh, I guess from he hearing the Killer Queen single. Is that when you discovered him too? Yeah. Same here. Yeah. And... Yeah. It was just 
no, nobody sounded like that, and still no, nobody does sound like this. It was a very unique, unique yeah. band that had all different kinds of all different elements that appealed to me, and still do. You know. Yeah, I mean, this record still sounds unbelievably great. Yep. And it takes you on such and a... And right over there, there's a tape machine used by Roy Thomas Baker, I heard. Yeah. <laughs> who right produced that room. record. Yeah, in this room. Yeah. yeah. It's, uh, it's on the other side of the studio mm -hmm. here. Now, Roy Thomas Baker, by the way, speaking of which, I had lunch with him one time, and, or he had tea, and um, and uh, we talked to him, told me all kinds of stories about Queen in the studio, which yeah. were pretty amazing. So I took him out to lunch nice. so I could hear those stories. Yeah. But... This record from the very beginning, like Brighton Rock, mm -hmm. you know, people keep discovering Queen and love Queen, whether it's because of the Bohemian Rhapsody movie, but young kids are into them. But it was cool that there was a movie about a year or two years ago called Baby Driver. And oh, during yeah, one yeah. of the chase scenes, they used Brighton Rock. Oh, it was, it was br brilliant. Brilliant. Did you, when you saw that, were you like, oh my God, it's yeah, Brighton Rock? Just from the, from the first, the whole, uh, it seems like the whole movie, which I think it was, was written around the soundtrack. Yeah. Every scene was perfect. Every song went perfectly with each scene. It, yeah. was, it was really well done. Yeah, it was really cool. And, and I love uh, that. Just to hear Brighton Rock in there. Right. And the first time that I went to England, I found out that Brighton Rock was rock candy. Like when you go out on the pier, like or like a carnival, the rock candy is called Brighton Rock. I in did Brighton, not, uh, the Brighton. I did not pier. know this. Yeah. It's good to know. Isn't that funny, but, Brighton Rock? Because yeah. it's, it's at the Brighton Pier for you know that seaside town where... The right. Who's Quadrophenia and all that stuff. Right, was. but I, I liked it also because of, you know nobody was really doing those guitar orchestrations and and using the echo plaques to get sound on sound. Not a lot of people were doing it back then. And then Brian May was really nice innovator, kind of. Yeah, I found out later he was just kind of emulating Les Paul, but with with his sound on sound and cool shit like that. But he was but great. That, and how yeah, about yeah. I mean, we, I think we both agree the first speed metal song ever is on this album, Stone Cold Crazy. Well, for sure. Without a question, that is the first speed metal song. Metallica have covered it. Yeah. And uh, it's two and a half minutes of uh, pure rock bliss. It's genius. Yeah, it's, it's pre pretty hard. I mean, there's there's some there's some tracks that I would probably skip over now, but it's a whole, one of my favorite Queen, it is my favorite Queen album. Yeah, mine too. I love the record. And it's a pretty stark album cover, by the way, that Mick Rock took. Yeah, by putting sweat all over them, like, like they look like they just all had heart attacks. So that, yep. I think, freaked a few people out when uh, it ended up in the stores back yes, in the for day. Sure. It, it was, you know, definitely cutting edge for its day. Yeah, for its time, nineteen seventy four, seventy five, which is amazing. Now, the fact that you have gotten to play with Marky and you've loved the Ramones in general for so many years. I mean, Tommy's the one on this record, of yep. course, because uh, Marky didn't join until Road to Ruin. Right, but. Um, this is such a great album, the third Ramones album, Rocket to Russia. Yeah. Right? And the first album I bought was Ramones Leave Home. That's the yeah. first one I heard. So that was when I, I got into him. But to me, this all the way through is one of my favorites. Yeah. Is it, I mean, it's got songs on there that weren't even singles, like I Can't Give You Anything. It's just yeah. like one of my favorites. But you got Rockaway Beach on there, right? Yeah. And uh, what are some of your other favorites on there? Like, I Don't Care. And it's just, yeah. a, as a whole, I mean, um, the first three or four. Ramones albums, the whole thing, all the way through, all of them is good. But for some reason, this was always my favorite. Yeah. And uh, just, I think the production level was up, up a notch on this one. The guitar sounded thicker and heavier. So yeah. I was more drawn to this one out of all the other early Ramones records. Do you remember the first time you saw the band play live? Yeah, I actually saw them play, little known fact, I was ditch school one day to be an extra in rock and roll high school no. uh, and the scene where they're uh, they're waiting in line to buy uh to get into the, the concert and yeah and the rounds pull up and they're and literally they're just, i just want to have something to do they're in the car yeah yeah and so I, he's playing he's got his sticks and yeah I, I didn't make it on on screen but you know you got paid like maybe 20 bucks and got fed lunch but you're was, somewhere in there i'm somewhere in there yeah I, but they also did uh the live sequences at the uh at the roxy so I went and saw them play at the Roxy, and that was a. Oh, so you were for, at that show? I was at that show where they were filming the live stuff for. How far were you staying away, away from the from the mouse? Like the uh, remember when the, when the oh, mouse yeah, and yeah. the rat exploded in the movie? <laughs> yeah, which is so great because the Ramones they played other rock and roll, but when it got the Ramones, they actually exploded. Right, uh, the rodents, and so yeah. there was a giant like road, uh, you know, rodent dancing in the audience. Yeah, I, I saw some in the pit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Oh, it's amazing that you were part of that show. That is incredible. Speaking of movies, The Clan of Western Civilization, right? You were in that too. Yes. Tell me about what that experience was like. I mean, just to sidetrack for a second. <coughs> uh, yeah, they were filming. We, Circle Jerks were only to get band, to, uh, together for maybe three or four months. So we, we kind of maybe were the last band to get in and included. And we were very, very excited because we didn't know if we really deserved it. <laughs> but it really, it really, uh, you know. Helped, helped elevate helped the band. Elevate right? the band, yeah. It really brought light to the all the great music that was going around at the time. You yeah. Know, bands like X and Black Flag were in it. And it was just, you know, one of those things we lucked into being within one year, Group Sex, The Decline in Western Civilization, and the first Rodney compilation. It was, you know, a good... All of a sudden, your name a good was hat, everywhere. A good hat trick of everything. Uh, our name was everywhere. Then Let Them Eat Jelly Beans as well, the other great, do not, not documentary, uh, compilation that came yeah. out around the same time. Yeah. Yeah, that was cool too. So there was, I so mean, it really exposed us to a more worldly audience, more, yeah. bigger audience. It's amazing for when you, look, when you look back on it, how quick all that stuff took place. Yeah. We went from like a local band to being known nationally and internationally because of stuff like that. And to be, you know, I've been in three really important bands, uh, California bands, with all right. three of the bands that you were, you've been in, which is pretty amazing, you know? And you did a thing called Black President for a little while too, right? Yeah. So tell me about that real quick. Uh, yeah, I was with Charlie, who was in Goldfinger, and Christian Martucci. Who does he play with now? Oh, Stone Sour, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was just a little side project with, with some friends. And I didn't really have much time to devote to it, so they kicked me out of the band. Yeah. But you were busy. You <laughs> I was busy. Right. I got it. It was, it was all good. Yeah. You know, it's pretty amazing, though. But uh, I just got to say, I mean, I, I just love that you were able to come in, Greg, and we finally got you in here because I know we had some technical problems We the went through time. seven albums already? Did we go through? We got it with them all. Damn. I cannot that believe great. we blew through those seven Woo. albums so quickly. Um, yeah. yeah but, I'm, gl I mean, I'm glad we were able to, I had a do-over. Sorry yeah. for anybody that tried... I apologize to anybody that tried to log in first time and I felt like such a loser. No, you weren't, man. I mean, sometimes, you know, we get those technical problems when we can't even, you know. Yeah. That's, I blame it on the internet company. That's what mm -hmm. you've got to do. And by the way, uh, just so people know, you can always watch this episode on demand. If you're seeing it live and uh, some of your friends miss it, you can always tell people to go back on. Uh, it's really important. You know, I uh, just want to tell people that. Tell Greg, friend. really quick. So, so, yes, sir. So, I mean, when this pandemic passes, can mm -hmm. we expect both Circle Jerks Tour and Punk Art Karaoke shows? Yes. Right back to doing what you guys do best, right? As soon as we can. We're still trying to keep, keep our chops up. Circle Jerks are playing, practicing, and, you know, when, that, the, when the good lords open yeah. everything up. Yeah, <laughs> it'll be good. It'll be great when you do it. And yeah. so... Um, well, how, so you guys are going to continue to do punk or karaoke online with different singers yep. like you've done, which I had the honor of doing with you guys. You killed it, by the way. Yeah, thanks, man. It was so cool that Motorhead put their put it up there because yeah. then eighty five thousand people watched it, and you know, yeah, said I looked like my head was going to explode. <laughs> <laughs> it was intense, but, and I loved. You know, most of the comments were all really positive, which was yeah. mind blowing. So it was yeah. so cool that it was up there, and I remember the night we were celebrating Halloween and. Uh, and I remember you telling me that it was up there and it had it, it gotten up there. And, I, you know, all the comments were really positive. And you know how brutal Motorhead fans can be if they don't like the way you do something. Yeah. They will shred you. Um, I thought the one funny comment was, he looks like he snorted a pile of cocaine. I'm like, no, I'm clean and sober now. That's my natural look, which is so true. You know what I mean? That's it. So, uh, that was But funny. it was pretty funny. Yeah, it was and you can attest that I was sober when I recorded that. Yes, sir. But my head, my, my veins were popping out of my head a little bit, though. But yeah, that's a but cool you got to. You got to get intense if you're playing, doing that song and sing, singing Motorhead. You got to. Yeah. yeah, you can't, you can't, you can't lame through that at all. No, right? you know. But I, I got to say, Greg, thanks so much for coming on the show and doing this. I had man. a good time, and thanks for having me. It was great to have you, man. Greg Hetson, everybody. Don't forget, you can get the Circle Jerks Group Sex. Uh, the new edition of the record has so much cool stuff in it. The vinyl release. Trust Records Company is a company that released it. They'll also put out Wild in the Street soon. And uh, how do they find Punk Art Karaoke, uh, your vi the videos? Just go to um, our Instagram or Facebook. Yeah, for Punk Rock Karaoke. Yep. Yeah. Go there and watch all those incredible performances from uh, people from a ton of punk bands. A lot of legends on there. 
uh, singing some uh, of their other heroes' songs. And, and then just really some cool. of our friends and random people are up there doing a great job too. Anybody can do it. Yeah. So you can even submit a version of a song yourself. And if they really love it, I think they'll put it up on their site, right? Could be. Could the, be. One of they're, them. They're, I think one of them wasn't that to give it back one that the girl uh, sent you. We've had we've had you know uh, we've had uh, uh, civilians yeah. up there too. Yeah, people that aren't in in bands. Yeah, it's great. We I like to mix it up. I think it's cool that you do. Well, people can go check that out on their Instagram page, Facebook page, and also if you'd like to watch past episodes or rewatch this episode of In a Lonely Place, all you got to do is go to youtubecom Rolling Live Studios which is where we're coming to you from right now here in Studio City. And we are safe in social distancing, right? Yes, we are. We are absolutely doing We always do that without a question. Listen, thanks so much for watching us. It's In a Lonely Place. And remember, you're never alone if you've got music in your life. That's what I want to tell you because it's kept me going. And I'm still here. And I plan on sticking around for a while. Thanks so much for watching. Have yourself a great weekend. We will be back next week right here coming to you from Rolling Live Studios. Okay, take care, and thanks for watching.